Hi everyone and welcome to Rose Red Homestead where we are going to share with you today how we have boxed up our emergency meals after we did that shopping trip. And I can tell you that yes, I needed a list, but no, I couldn't make a list because I did not know what was available and you can't make a list unless you know what you're shopping for. But now I have a much better idea and I would do things quite a bit differently. I learned so much. Jim and I both learned more than I can share on this video, although I am going to share some things. So we had to do two more quick trips to um, a store to get pick up, I think about three things, maybe four things, so that I could put the meals together. Once I got there and could see what was available, then I could start formulating meals in my head. So the first thing that we're going to do is go through these boxes day one, day two, and day three, and I'm going to explain to you how I boxed up everything. And then I've made a couple of changes to things that I, um, to our parameters that I need to share with you. First of all, these three things were not used. The uh, potatoes, someone suggested we could have made potato soup with this and they were absolutely right. We did not use this, nor did I use this canned pineapple. Um, we did buy some instant non-fat dry milk, and I'll be explaining about that in just a minute. Here's the oil that we did purchase, and they're set aside because I have realized what I need. Some of these things rotate through successive meals, and what I need is to have a separate bin for things like staples that I'll be drawing on. But let's just start right here with day one. And uh, this is what we have. For breakfast, we're using pancakes, and that requires a pancake mix, some oil and syrup, and then some fruit juice. Now here is the fruit juice. This is something I would not buy again. It was expensive. I thought, well, if I buy it in a larger size, um, it needs refrigeration after opening. We may not have refrigeration, so I opted for individual servings. That was kind of a mistake on my part, but for these meals, I would use these for sure. I just can't fit them in the bin. So for lunch, um, mac and cheese. Now the mac and cheese requires butter and milk. It has been years and years since I have made mac and cheese from a box. I didn't remember, nor did I look on the back to check the directions. And so we were left a little bit up the creek without a paddle on that one because I didn't buy any butter. We did go out and buy milk, but I'm going to tell you how we resolved that. Notice that there are some red arrows by some of these things, and what that means is they won't be totally used by the meals that we're preparing this day, so they can be rotated through and used for other meals. And then I had decided that I would add a little protein to the mac and cheese, and uh, add some tuna, a can of tuna to it for more protein. And someone else suggested a great thing that they do with mac and cheese by adding tuna and then they add bacon bits and some other things too, so it sounded great. And then um, the fruit for that lunch is going to be the pears. And it was a large can of pears <clears throat> right here. And this would be completely used up by four people. Then for supper, Supper was going to be spaghetti, and that called for uh, sp spaghetti sauce for the pasta, and you may remember that Jim picked up a one-pound package of pasta. Now, this one-pound package will do two meals for a family of four. So this one also is paid forward for another meal. And then I decided that I would slice up the Vienna sausage and add it to the pasta sauce. It, the pasta sauce does have sausage with it, but I'm going to add a little more protein to that by adding the Vienna sausage. Then I would do the green bean casserole with a can of green beans, a can of mushroom soup, which we had to buy because I didn't get it at the store when we went. And then uh, that little can of are the fried onions. And then we, one of the things that we added was some Parmesan cheese. We had to go back to the store and get that to put on the top. And that, of course, would be paid forward as well. It's a small container of Parmesan cheese. We certainly would not use this for one meal, but um, it's the smallest size we could get, so it's paid forward for additional meals as well. And that is pretty much what our day one looks like. 
and I will put this puzzle back together again at a later time. Okay, for day two. Day two breakfast is going to be the canned potatoes. I bought one can of whole potatoes and I would um, slice those and then I would pan fry them with the Spam. And I would need a little bit of our oil, which I did buy, and um, probably some, some seasoning as well. And um, for doing emergency meals when we shelter at home, we do have the advantage of having whatever else we already have on hand. And so I do have spices that I would add to that to flavor that up just a little bit. And let's see what else. Oh, and I have one can of green chilies here. And I would use half the can of this green chilies in those breakfast potatoes. And then for lunch, I have the, sometimes it's called three can chili, or sometimes it's called pantry chili. And it is when you buy um, like three cans, different types of cans, different types of beans. And then we would add to that some tomatoes, crushed tomatoes, and some salsa, as well as some spices that I already have here on hand. And then to go along with that, I would add this um, Jiffy corn muffin mix to go with the chili. Now, the chili, this mix requires milk and eggs. I don't, I don't know why I thought I could just add water and have this work, but it requires milk and eggs. The milk we have, the eggs I'm going to deal with in just a minute. We'll tell you about that. And then for supper, we would have the corned beef on sauerkraut. And this is a meal that could be eaten just cold right out of the can if necessary. Or you could heat it up. You could make a bed with the sauerkraut and put a slice of the corned beef. Divide this can, just cut it into four pieces like this. And then put one of those on a bed of um, sauerkraut on each plate. Or you could crumble up the corned beef and heat it with the sauerkraut, whatever works for your family. And then along with that, we would have some of this suddenly salad, which you're supposed to just be able to add water, cook the pasta and mix in the flavoring and it would be done. And then um, uh, beets. And I bought uh, shoestring beets. One of the things that I tried to do, and I just do naturally because I've been doing it for so many years, is not only thinking about the nutrition, thinking about food groups, but thinking about um, strong flavors, good flavors, but strong flavors, as well as colors and textures. And so I think that's one thing that worked well when I did this. Other, there are other ways that I know that I can really improve, and we'll talk about that in just a minute. So that's day two. For day three, we would start with overnight oats using these steel-cut oats. And of course, this is also paid forward because there's plenty of here for several more breakfasts. So I would use a thermal cooker to do that. I would bring everything to a boil, put it in a thermal cooker, like just a thermos, and then let it sit overnight to cook. I would also add some of these craisins to it as well so that we would have that. And then uh, some fruit juice, of course. Then for lunch, I would do the vegetable beef soup. And I realized I needed some kind of bread. And so one of the additions that we made was I just got some Krusty's cranberry orange muffin mix. Now this of course requires vegetable oil, which we have, and eggs, which we're gonna talk about. Then for supper, um, I, have a, I bought another can of this chicken so that we would have enough for four people. So there's two cans of those, that chicken. I bought a gravy mix, which I didn't get originally. Uh, the stovetop stuffing. And then mixing carrots and mandarin oranges. And that is so yummy. You pretty much drain the mandarin oranges and then you heat them and let them caramelize, let the syrup caramelize just a little bit. And then you add the carrots and it just makes a lovely, lovely side dish that's very beautiful. That orange is really nice. 
So those are our meals. I was really trying to avoid things that called for eggs and milk, but I didn't manage to do that. And one of the things that I realized, um, one of the lessons that I learned here was that if, if we're going to do this type of a thing with emergency meals, I need to figure out a way that I can have eggs on hand and milk and also bread. Those three things greatly enhance the diversity of foods that you can have, even when using mixes if you're not going to mix up your own. Um, which a lot of people make up their own mixes. I was so thrilled. It has been so much fun and such an education to read the comments under the two videos so far, the, the micro moment on Monday and then our uh, shopping spree on Wednesday. Oh my goodness, the ideas that have come forward are just absolutely incredible. So I did buy a small box of uh, non-fat dry milk. Now, um, because I know that a lot of you don't have the option of being able to do your own on this. And, and some of you are, are just living like many of us have at uh, some point or other in our lives, living from paycheck to paycheck and there's just no extra money. I remember when I was a young married, um, and this was in the 60s, way, way long ago before most of you were born, I put my first husband through dental school I was a school teacher. He did not work, was not generating any income. My income at that time, I started off at $4,500 a year. That was my salary. And after four years, it had moved up to $6,000. And so uh, money for us, we were not only paying for dental school, but all of our expenses, our rent and food. My food budget was $5 a week. And back then, hamburger was five pounds for a dollar. Gas was 17 cents a gallon. Those days are gone forever. Um, but today, it's no different. People who are on a really tight budget have to face the very same type of feelings and angst and emotion about that. And, and I could not, uh, with, on that tight budget, we sometimes ran out of money before the end of the week. And phew, we just had to cinch our belts and have a bowl of cereal for three meals a day. Uh, there was another time in my life when I was a single mom of six children and I had to sell some pretty valuable things that were valuable to me so I could have enough money for a month to pay for food for us to eat. So I get it. I really get it when things are tough and these are the tough times that we are living in right now. And a lot of us are feeling it very much so. And the, the hard thing about that is that when you are on such a t tight budget, you cannot do things. Your limitation, your resource limitations prevent you from taking advantage of sales. When things are on sale, you can still just afford the one that you need for that week because you don't have the money. And so it's really, really tough to get ahead. About eggs. This is what I suggest, and it is not a perfect solution, but it, it might work in, in most or some emergency situation. These are frozen eggs. I took one dozen eggs and cracked one egg into each of 12 muffin cups in a regular muffin tin. Took a fork, scrambled them around, put them out in the freezer, uh, froze them solid, and then I moved them into this bag. Now, I would like to pop these right back in my freezer, but of course, we still have a dead refrigerator. Two months now, and we're still trying to get things figured out. So I've got to run these right back out to the freezer because they start to thaw pretty quickly. But eggs add so much diversity. The other thing that I forgot on the list of things that you need to add is butter. And so in your freezer, set aside a spot where you could freeze a dozen eggs or maybe two and don't touch them. They are good for a year in your freezer. Also freeze a couple of pounds of butter and keep those strictly for emergency times when you can add them to these kinds of meals. And then just rotate through everything else but those. Those things would be good for at least a year in your freezer. And then, of course, you will want to rotate through them. But hold them sacrosanct 
so you don't dip into them. That's for your emergency cash. So I'm going to run these back out to the freezer and I'll re be right back. Okay, now for some of the lessons we have learned and some recommendations. First of all, in the comments, which again, we are loving. Jim and I keep running back and forth to our offices. So let me read you this comment. Let me read you this comment. So many good ideas. We had a number of people from Florida who face hurricane season and others locations in the Gulf Coast that face hurricane season and it's coming up right now. And I just read an article a few minutes ago that said they are expecting this hurricane season to be about a 75% chance that this season is going to be more robust. And so those people, pretty much every single one of them said, I don't want to cook when we're in an emergency like with hurricanes. I don't want to cook anything. I just want to pack things in, in our meal preps that I can just open and eat. Peanut butter and crackers, tuna and crackers, a can of pork and beans, a can of fruit cocktail. And that is absolutely great thinking because one of the main things that we need to think about is the type of emergencies that we are likely to be faced with that will cause us to shelter in place at home. Or if you run out of money before the end of the month and have to dip into your emergency stuff. And so plan accordingly. For Jim and me, we don't face hurricanes or tornadoes. We don't, we, we could have an earthquake. Um, we don't even face floods. Now we have um, a very localized flood at the end of our street about twice in 13 years where water has run through our yard, but it has never come in the house. And it's over with, the flood itself is over with in just a few hours. So it's not like a big flood that is going to impact us for days. So what we plan for is sheltering in place during things like a prolonged power outage. If that's the case, then we can use these meals that require a little bit of cooking and some baking, provided we have the equipment needed to do that. And we're going to talk about that in just a second. Second thing, one person said, boy, looking over the things that we bought, you're going to need a lot of water. And she was right. It, this is going to require some water in our cooking. Now, we have been preaching the importance of water storage since day one of when we opened our channel four and a half years ago. And so what my assumption was is that everyone has water stored. If you don't, now is the time for you to store water. And uh, most of the recommended um, information says that you need to store at least one gallon of water per person in your family per day. And some go as high as two gallons. Jim and I store three gallons of water per person per day, and we have it for more than two weeks. And so store enough water for drinking, for a little bit of hygiene, and for cooking, baking, whatever is needed. So that is really, really important. Several people said you also need to store comfort foods, snack foods, uh, like crackers or cookies or even candy, things like that. And that is really a good idea. If we are having to live with our emergency food, our entire lives are going to be disrupted, at least for a time. And having things like that to fall back on are really a good idea. Now, in each of our vehicles, we have a two-gallon bucket with a gamma lid that we keep little snacks in individual packages. And that's what we would dip into if necessary. So then... Um, Considering what people in Florida say that they don't want to cook, most of these would be eliminated. Most of these would not work for people who don't want to do any cooking. But I want to do cooking. Maybe some of the rest of you would plan on doing cooking. Um, and so therefore, we need to decide whether our meals are going to require cooking or no cooking, and then plan accordingly. If they require cooking, then what are we going to use? If we assume that the grid is going to be down, and it may not be down in all emergency situations, but we have to plan as if it would be. So what are our options? And um, in our previous videos, we have covered the gambit of from very inexpensive options to very expensive options like a Traeger stovetop 
pellet burning griddle, grill. Um, and so if you're at this other end, we have videos on how to make your own um, rocket stove using cinder blocks, how to make an oven out of a cardboard box wrapped in foil, how to make a solar cooker with cardboard box and foil. This is a loaf of whole grain bread that I just pulled out of the oven a few minutes ago. And um, I, Jim and I did a series of three bread classes right here in our home for local folks uh, earlier in the summer. And uh, one of the things that we demonstrated was baking bread in that cardboard box oven covered in foil using charcoal. And I baked a loaf of this very bread in that oven. And, and it turned out just beautifully. So there are some low cost options that you can think about in terms of um, off-grid cooking. Um, my recommendation is for you to use, um, to, if at all possible, a little butane burner. And um, those can be used indoors. If, over in Asia, they use them indoors for almost all of their cooking. Now, the downside is that you have to purchase fuel for them. Well, the fuel is quite inexpensive compared to propane. And so um, we buy it uh, when we can on sale and buy the case. Um, then one option that we really have not shown very much is using a little Coleman camp stove oven. And I'm gonna just show you that right now. This little oven fits right over a burner, like on a Coleman stove. And it has racks on the inside. I have a, um, a stone, a, like a pizza stone that I put in the very bottom that helps um, equalize the heat throughout. I think the racks are crooked. I, yeah, yeah, is it crooked? Yeah. I kind of heard it tilt when I was bringing it in the house. It's kind of dirty. It's been out in the garage. And I use this over a rocket stove. It got very, very smoky on the inside. So I would recommend using it over a burner, like either a, a propane camp stove, like a Coleman camp stove, or that little butane. In addition, I got this welding blanket. It's a three foot by three foot that I cut to go over this to add a little bit of insulation. And we're gonna do a video on this. I have, I have shown one video where I bake some, a tiny loaf of bread inside a Dutch oven, inside this oven. But we need to do some other experimenting with it and we will. This is a fairly, it is a step above the do-it-yourself cardboard and foil things that we've shown, but for about $150, you can have a, a butane burner, an oven like this, and a um, welding blanket like that, that you cut to fit over. And um, you would have a pretty darn good option for off-grid cooking and baking, because the burner you could just use anytime you needed to boil water or whatever. And then the other, option for off-grid cooking that is fairly inexpensive would be um, Dutch oven cooking. A lot of our viewers have found wonderful Dutch oven pieces at garage sales, at secondhand stores. And so there are lots of sources where we can look to try to find things. So we are going to be doing more along these lines. I want to do another video. We'll do a video on using this with the butane burner. And then I think we're going to do a video shopping at the dollar store, not just for meals, but for other things that we might be able to add to our emergency supplies. And um, in fact, our, our um, drugstore, Walgreens, now has an aisle with food. And so we're going to check them out too. It's all canned goods and dry goods like dollar store, but we're going to check them out too. And we'll bring that information to you as well. The last thing I want to suggest is that once we box these up and you don't need these fancy bins, you can just use um, grocery bags or boxes or whatever you may have to sort your meals, is to every once in a while pull one of these bins out and spend a day eating the three meals that you have um, planned and then replenish them so that you can rotate through so the food doesn't get old. One of our parameters was that all of the foods have to have at least a six-month shelf life 
Some have much longer than that, but we wanted to be sure that every six months, we will be rotating through these ourselves to make sure that things don't get too old. So that, in a nutshell, is, is what we have learned so far. We have a lot more to learn, and we will be sharing that with you. So thank you so much, and please keep your comments coming. They are a valuable education for all of us. So we will see you very soon with our next video.